Downing of a 117 stealth bomber has to date remained an interesting topic. Even though it happened way back in 1999 during Operation Allied Force over what was then the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Some myths about the Downing remain, so this video will try to debunk them, using information from interviews with the commander of the SAM unit that hit the plane as the primary source. We will also show how exactly the F-117 got hit. Back to our video. It was made in collaboration with Molny from Militavia, and there's a link to said YouTube channel below our video. It is often said that the F-117 was hit because it used the same route as on previous nights, and that a Neva missile battery, which was indeed commanded by one Zoltan Dani, then deployed along that route. That such ideal location shortened the targeting distance, which made it possible to down the plane. In reality, Dani's missile battery left the peacetime deployment area a day before the first night of NATO's strikes. The battery deployed to an old spare SA-75 Dvina SAM site, which was built in the 60s, near Shimanovci. That location was selected simply because it was available and the battery did not move since then. It remained generally silent, not using its radar, which is why it survived. Though the question does remain, why did it become more active when it did? Another myth sort of ties into that, suggesting that the takeoff moment of the F-117 Nighthawk could be tracked by civilians and thus the interception could be directed. But just because an airplane takes off in a certain place, it does not tell anything about its destination, the route used, the time of arrival or the possible location of its target. Based on this vague information, it is not possible to time the engagement. Yet another myth suggests Colonel Dani changed the working frequency of the radar without permission of his superiors. Allegedly, that increased the range of the radar dramatically. But in fact, Dani himself stated that only minor modifications were made to the target acquisition radar, and that the fire control radar, crucial for the attack, was not changed at all. Finally, the opening of the weapon base on the F-117 allegedly enabled the SAM battery to hit it. While it's theoretically possible that the search radar might have gotten a quick glimpse of something, the more important fire control radar would not have profited from that. Opening and closing of the weapon bay doors lasts only for a few seconds. In such a short time, it is not even possible to lock onto the target, let alone enable the missile to reach the target. The whole tracking and firing process lasts much longer, and a continuous radar lock is required. So what did happen that night? The F-117 was down with an S-125M Neva air defense system, but its equipment differed from the standard battery. After the retirement of the S-75M Volkov SAM system, the Serbian air defense did not scrap the P-18 target acquisition radars that were part of said system. Compared to the P-15 low altitude target acquisition radar of the S-125M system, the P-18 is far more suitable for detecting targets flying above 6 km in altitude. In addition, the P-18 operates using a longer wavelength frequency, a meter frequency and not a decimeter one. Thus, its detection range against the MiG-21 sized fighter is 270 km, instead of P-15's 140 km, approximately. Danny's missile battery had such a P-18 target acquisition radar, rather than the standard P-15. Another important factor was luck in several ways. At the beginning of the conflict, Belgrade was defended by the 250th Air Defense Brigade, with eight Neva missile batteries. From the beginning of the operation, it was evident Yugoslavia was no match for the Western Coalition. For this reason, the preservation of the air defense assets of the Serbian army became the priority, rather than taking unacceptably high risks to try and shoot down a few planes. Before the outbreak of the conflict, every missile battery of the brigade was relocated. They left their peacetime locations and formed a defensive ring some 10 to 30 kilometers away from Belgrade. NATO airplanes were expected from the southwestern direction, from Bosnia. Only two or three missile batteries were on alert at any given night, while the rest relocated or rested. Therefore, it was just a matter of luck that a NATO plane flew into the engagement zone of a missile battery. If a NEVA battery was not on alert, it did not have permission to turn on their radars. The missile batteries used landline phones to communicate with brigade headquarters whenever possible. On the third night of the operations, three NEVA batteries were on alert. 
the third at Shimanovci, the fifth at Progar, and the seventh at Bojdarovic Sam site. All were west of Belgrade. They expected NATO planes from the west. At 5 pm, the fifth missile battery got hit. It was the first SAM loss of the conflict. F 117 stealth fighters took off from Aviano in Italy and flew over Slovenian airspace. They were not escorted by EA 6B prowlers, which could jam radars and suppress air defenses. The F 117s carried out aerial refueling above Hungary. After that, they flew southeast along the Romanian Serbian border to Belgrade. The strike planes approached the city from the northeast, where they were least expected. When it became obvious that NATO strike planes were over Belgrade, bombs had already been dropped. Two NEVA units remaining on alert turned on their target acquisition radars. Radar operators did not experience the usual electronic jamming this night, so planes were clearly visible on the indicator screen of the P-18 radar. After turning on the acquisition radar, Zoltan Dani's B battery detected two targets, one close by and another one at a greater distance. The targets were leaving Belgrade's airspace, they flew towards the safe airspace of Hungary. Danny's battery focused on the closer target. According to Danny, they didn't know at the time that it was the F-117 that they detected. That was revealed only after the wreckage was found. After turning on the P-18, it was evident that the nearest target was 23 kilometers away. At this moment, target search with the fire control radar was also attempted, all the while the P-18 target acquisition radar continuously tracked the target. The first target search was performed with a bearing of 210 degrees. The target did not appear on the screen of the fire control radar. Yet, according to the P-18 radar, the target was closing in, as the distance was just 17 kilometers. The second target search was attempted at 203 degrees. It was again unsuccessful. The target distance had dropped to just 15 kilometers. Finally, on the third attempt, the target appeared on the fire control radar screen. The distance was 14 kilometers, altitude 6 kilometers, bearing 240 degrees. Due to the small size of the target, the manual target tracking was performed by the crew. The three-point missile guidance method was selected. Two missiles were launched when the target bearing was 245 degrees. But the second missile malfunctioned. Neva's missile tracking system could not track it. After 21 seconds of flight, approximately 14 kilometers away from the battery, the first missile's proximity fuse detonated the warhead near the target. By then, the target altitude had increased to 7 kilometers, and the bearing was 270 degrees. The wreckage of the F-117 was found near the village of Bujanovci. Manual target tracking was not easy and it had to be performed quickly because the F-117 flew at 900 kilometers per hour. Shooting down the Nighthawk was quite a feat. So what was needed to achieve it? Based on the azimuth and distance provided by the P-18, the fire control radar could perform the search and lock onto the target quickly. This was the only way to quickly lock onto the target in time to finish the kill chain. The P-18 radar was essential for this, but not every Serbian NEVA battery had it. Four P-18s were available for the eight NEVA batteries. It was pure luck that Danny's unit had one. Roughly 90 seconds passed from the P-18's detection to the missile hit. The relocation to the right site was also pure luck, nothing else. The fire control radar could detect the Nighthawk only from a slant range of 14 kilometers. The system's minimal engagement range was 8 kilometers. Therefore, the F-117 had to fly within roughly 5 to 6 kilometer wide corridor for at least 90 seconds for the Neva missile battery to have a chance. If it had flown only 3 kilometers farther or closer, or flown at a heading just 10 degrees off its actual heading, then it would have been outside the detection or engagement zone of the fire control radar. The very short detection range of the fire control radar was a bottleneck. It did not matter at what distance the P-18 radar detected the Nighthawk, as long as the detection range provided necessary time for the kill chain. If the Nighthawk had been flying a few kilometers farther away, then the missile battery would have just watched the target hopelessly on the P-18's radar screen, as their fire control radar would not have been able to engage. So even if the P-18 had detected the stealth plane from 100 kilometers away, it wouldn't have mattered. Crucially, there was no standoff jamming used. If the P-18 had been jammed by an EA-6B prowler, it would have been impossible to shoot down the Nighthawk. 
The very limited search capability of the fire control radar was insufficient for scanning a larger airspace. This also disproves the common myth that the Nighthawk was totally safe without escort by jammer planes. It was also just a matter of luck that the F-117 was not escorted by F-16s with anti-radar harm missiles. Those could have neutralized the SAM battery after it went active. But it has to be noted that in most cases Danny allowed only very short use of the fire control radar. Transmissions longer than 21 seconds were allowed on very rare occasions. That would have made use of anti-radiation missiles more difficult. While the P-18 was immune to harms because of its meter wavelength, the fire control radar was still under risk. Its shorter wavelength was something the seeker on the harm missile was devised to work against. Allegedly, the use doctrine stipulated that if the fire control radar was used for any period, the battery had to immediately initiate relocation, even if they did not launch a single missile. During Operation Allied Force, 23 harm missile wrecks were found near SAM batteries. This provides quite a good picture of how dangerous it was to turn on the fire control radar and why it had to be restricted to very short periods. One of the most interesting aspects of the whole incident is that it allowed for the radar cross-section of the F-117 to be calculated, at least when calculating its RCS when looked from one specific direction. The parameters of the fire control radar and the distance at which first detection occurred are known, so using the radar equation, the RCS of the Nighthawk can be determined. This is the only authentic and publicly known measured radar cross-section value of any stealth airplane. The fire control radar of the Neva uses a 1.5 by 1.5 degree wide pencil beam. Its peak impulse power is 170 kilowatt. The receiver sensitivity is minus 93 decibels and the operational frequency is 9500 megahertz. The slant range was 14 kilometers at an altitude of 6 kilometers, which means a 12 kilometer projected distance on land. After inputting the values, the result for the returned signal from the Nighthawk is minus 21.1 decibels, which equates to 0.0012 meters squared. The result actually confirms the rumors about the RCS of the F-117. Before the war, various sources claimed RCS values for the Nighthawk being between 0.0025 and 0.001 meters squared. It has to be noted that this is true only in a narrow aspect region. At the moment of detection, the radar bearing from the point of view of the Nighthawk was 80 degrees from the right. This indicates an airframe very well optimized for low RCS. This is just the opposite of the common belief, which takes for granted that stealth can be achieved only when the plane is observed from a narrow head-on angle. Until recently, it was not well known that another Neva battery defending Belgrade also scored a hit against a Nighthawk that took off from Germany. Because of the impact, the plane essentially lost one of its stabilizers and suffered an engine flameout. But the pilot was still able to return to base. Following the conflict, the pilot was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. It has to be said that the Nighthawk had its limitations. It had no self-defense system, not even a radar warning receiver. In fact, it had no radio connection when it flew near or in enemy airspace. To achieve the minimum radar cross-section, every antenna on the plane had to be retracted. Achieving a low radar cross-section was not possible any other way back when the Nighthawk was designed in the 1980s. Today's stealth planes have much greater self-defense capabilities. The Nighthawk was only capable of 4G maneuvers, near its top speed. Its limited maneuverability meant that it could not evade Neva's most advanced missile, which could turn at 15G at medium altitude. Zoltan Dani's unit downed the only other manned plane during the conflict, an F-16 CG fighter. A hit versus a B-2 bomber was also claimed, but this seems unlikely, because the B-2 flew its mission at altitude of an at least 14 kilometers. If it only had an F-117-like radar cross-section, it would be practically impossible for the fire control radar to detect the B-2. And in all likelihood, the B-2 has an even smaller RCS, so the whole point seems moot. In fact, the B-2 presented the capability first. Back then it flew without a jamming escort, and the enemy air defenses still didn't have a chance of shooting it down. This credit was also given to the F-117 at the time, but that ended up being untrue. That's it, thanks for watching. And also thanks to our buddy Balash for joining our ranks on this video. 
we hope to balance the tech news videos, Ukraine update videos and these kind of history videos. A little bit of everything for everyone.